Stanford University. My chemistry grades in college were my absolute worst grades. I did go on to get a PhD in molecular and cell biology, but I did appallingly bad, and I maintain that I would have done a lot better if I had met Dr. Alamandola much sooner, because what he does is he takes chemistry, instead of looking at it sort of like a pre-med weeder subject that you have to somehow survive your way through, at least that's how I felt about it, he takes it and you realize how exciting it is, that it's, it's evolved, that you really couldn't talk about chemistry at the time of the Big Bang, and then chemistry was very much circumscribed until you had generations of stars. And furthermore, that the chemistry that we see here on the Earth possibly could be found elsewhere, between the stars and other stars and other planets and other galaxies far, far away. And so that It's always fun. <laughs> It's always fun to come here and talk about this stuff because you're a general, wide open audience, and we don't get into the nitty gritty, but the conclusions are really wonderful, and the story is quite amazing. Okay, and from astrochemistry to astrobiology, by the end I'm going to have tried to convince all of you that astrobiology is astrochemistry, and that we're all here not because of magic, not because of strange things happen, but it's the step-by-step -step building of chemical complexity to eventually living organisms, solar system. I'm not talking about religion at all. This is completely fits into whatever you might happen to have as your belief uh, uh, scheme or ideas. But it's a fascinating story, and so let's get started. The outline, at first I'm going to set the astrophysical and astrochemical stage. How can we possibly know what we think we know? Then make a large jump to the evidence we have for the presence of complex molecules throughout space, as well as ices. And then finally end with what have these things got to do with astrobiology. And then at the end I'll have the section called tomorrow, which is mostly pretty pictures and some general concepts that might be useful to guide thinking and might actually have some implications for how we explore these other planets and so on as we get close enough to doing that. So the outline setting the stage, let's go back, way, way back to the mid-1960s when everyone who was in any <laughs> academic endeavor except for a rare handful of people believed there was no chemistry in space. Nothing existed out there, the, va the vacuum was too great, the temperature was too low, and the radiation fields too high. The molecules would just be ripped apart, and generally the evidence in the infrared, uh, in the visible, supported that. There was no infrared astronomy at that time. In fact, it was so commonly held that even there were some Disney programs with Ludwig von Drake floating around in space, talking about how there was nothing, uh, nothing out there. That spell was broken in the early to mid-60s with the discovery of uh, these very, very simple molecules, ammonia and H3, formaldehyde H2CO in 1969, and carbon monoxide, believe it or not, in 1970. So it's really not that long ago that we've realized there were some chemicals in space. And from your biochemical perspective, I understand most of you know more about biology than I do, these things you would hardly call molecules. But it was big news at the time, and it got people like Lou Snyder on the front of Time magazine, and quotes like this were is how the articles ended. Polyatomic molecules containing at least two atoms other than hydrogen can form in the interstellar medium. That was big news. The other, uh, the other part of setting the stage I want to do now is simply keep this in mind as we go through this, because we're going to end with some quite a complicated story, chemically speaking. We're talking about molecules that have function. The other side of the story is where do we fit in uh, astronomically, and here's where we are. I'm tempted to use this as a pointer, but I don't think that's a good idea. We're down here in the planets, asteroids, comet picture. The sun is nice and stable. But our story started a long, long time ago in a universe that didn't have all of these materials. And I'm going to start 
at the depth of the first levels of stars. The, what happens is a star is formed by the gravitational attraction of hydrogen in the early days after the Big Bang. I understand that's what you were talking about last, last week. The supermassive stars have now been post postulated to uh, grab a lot of hydrogen. Eventually, they get so massive that gravity in the center starts a nuclear reaction, and that's what energizes the star. And that nuclear reaction creates heavier elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. At the Big Bang, we just talked about hydrogen, lithium, and a few other light elements, but mostly hydrogen. Eventually, the star burns up all of its hydrogen fuel, ejects the heavier elements in the form of atoms, as well as small dust particles into the what's called diffuse interstellar medium, where the stuff floats around and drifts around. And this is the stuff you're looking to. When you look out at night and see stars, you're looking through what astronomers call the diffuse interstellar medium. Eventually, some of those large uh, winds and clouds condense into dense molecular clouds and form nebulae. And these are the things you've seen in pictures large molecular clouds, and that's where this talk is going to focus on, what goes on inside those clouds. Eventually, the same process occurs now, but not by the gravitational collapse of just hydrogen, but by the gravitational collapse of all the hydrogen that's in the cloud, as well as the dust and the gas. And that's what starts new star formation. And the stuff that doesn't get sucked into the stars forms the new planets, which is what people are looking for now. So it's really part of the, to answer part of your question earlier was the reason people are looking for all, all these planets, apart from it's just interesting to know if there are other planets outside the solar system, is how does it fit into a model? How do you make these solar systems, planetary systems? And you need data to do that. So that's a great, a lot of activities going on in astronomy now, star formation. That's a hot topic these days. And you need data. I mean, without, with only a handful of planets, and we only are looking with a very crude technique now that we oscillated to we'll learn more about that in a couple of days. Well, eventually a star is formed. The cloud breaks up into planetesimals, and from those planets form the things that don't get sucked into the planets, or around in your left, perhaps asteroids and comets, and we'll talk a lot more about those things later. So that's setting the stage. And you say, well, how do astronomers know this? Well, most of you can figure this one out. Uh, until very recently, 20, 25 years ago, most astronomers had telescopes on the ground looking at various objects in space. Uh, we're living at an amazing time. And now we have airborne observatories. We'll, we'll have a new one up soon. And we have spaceborne observatories as well. So this is just to set the overall uh, background. And for those of you who have really gotten into a spectroscopy, the way you can really tease out the detailed information about what's out there is not just taking these pretty pictures. Hubble pictures are wonderful, but as a good friend of mine says, a picture is worth a thousand words, and one spectrum is worth a thousand pictures. And you'll see from some of these pictures that the level of complexity is extremely high. And without this kind of spectroscopic <coughs> information, whether you like it or not, you need to do that. Uh, it's like good medicine, and that's where the information is really <coughs> long. So you might say, well, how can we possibly on Earth look at these things and understand what's out there chemically? Most of you have suffered through the periodic chart. Some of you have actually enjoyed it. And you say, well, given all of these elements and comp uh, possible compounds, how can we barely understand what's going on here on Earth, let alone what's going on out there, and you can start mixing things up. Well, astronomers have two tricks up their sleeve. The real astronomer's periodic chart is not this complicated, but it's really much simpler. It's, and the areas of each box is proportional to the relative amount of stuff that's out there. The universe is primarily hydrogen. And these are, this, is most, this is the remnant from the Big Bang. Very little hydrogen is formed by any other means. So, to for helium. But these heavier elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, and then the magnesium, silicon, sulfur, and so forth, were produced by the stellar burning cycle I just talked about. So in, to put the context of what we, talked about, what we heard about in the first talk today, with Avatar or any other speculation about life around the universe, life is a very opportunistic thing. It takes what it can handle. Uh, 
is at hand, and what's most at hand is carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and that's what we're mostly made of. When you look back at it this way, it's no big surprise. The odds of a silicon-based life form is probably pretty low. We're living on this huge ball of silicon. There are volcanoes. Temperatures are high. Temperatures are low. It's mixed with a lot of organics. At least up till now, uh, we don't know of any silicon-based life forms. So odds are it's going to the secret's going to be with C and no. And uh, so the problem then gets much simpler. It's still complicated chemistry, but it's a lot simpler. The other trick astronomers have. Uh, we have the benefit of now is infrared astronomy. On the left, you see the portion of the sky with the Orion constellation. The three bell stars are in the center. The arms and the legs are obvious. There's also the sword that ends in the tip of the great nebula in Orion, and I'll get back to that later. That's a region of star formation. But in the infrared, the region looks very, very different. The whole part of the sky is glowing, and that's because what's we tend to think of these things all in the same place, but what you're actually seeing are the stars in front of a giant molecular cloud. It's the giant molecular cloud in Orion is the name, the big surprise. And you see hints of it in those, that reddish glow behind it. That's where the edge of the cloud is going. The Horsehead Nebula is right there at the left, the belt star. But it's because of this infrared that has really opened a lot of uh, open up a lot of the secrets in these dark, dense molecular clouds. And the reason is uh, chemists have long used spectroscopy in the infrared as an analytical tool. And what you can see here, is there a point in this? No, let me just do this. The beauty of the infrared is whatever absorbs in this region, everything that has a hydrogen in it, carbon, hydrogen bond, nitrogen, hydrogen bond, or uh, oxygen hydrogen bond, they will all absorb around three microns. Likewise, the carbon oxygen bond, CO, CO2, <coughs> fall between four and five <coughs> microns. And then the bending motions of the CHs fall out there at all the wavelengths. And so just as you, this is all made popular now on programs like CSI and so forth, but that's basically what astronomers are doing and what they're doing on CSI and any other laboratory, analytical laboratory. And the infrared spectrum tells you what kind of compounds are in the material you're studying. The difficulty is that the atmosphere blocked fully half of the infrared and made it pretty much useless for a thorough uh, chemical analysis or even an indication of what was out there. That changed in the early to mid-70s with the Kalper Airborne Observatory. This really pioneered a lot of uh, the infrared. It opened up fully the half of the infrared that was obscured when you were looking below those clouds at space. This used to be stationed at NASA Ames. You can still, the plane is still there. This will soon be followed in the next couple of years by the SOFIA, S-O-F-I-A, the Stratosphere Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And that little black hole behind the cockpit has a small telescope, and we would fly around looking at these various things, and I'll show you some of those spectrum in a little while, but this really laid the foundation. This <coughs> proved that mid-infrared was worth it, and since then it's been followed up with the IRS satellite. The Europeans launched the Infrared Space Observatory. We most recently launched the Spitzer Space Telescope. As I said, Sophia is about to go, and now Herschel has just been launched a year ago for far infrared. So there's a wealth of information here, and it's still being exploited. So that basically set the astrophysical stage. We've gone to the large picture, the context of what I'll be talking about, and now we'll move into the specifics with large molecules and ices. So we'll come back to the center of the Great Nebula in Orion, that part that's glowing there. This is a Hubble picture, it has four very hot, very young O-type stars, strong UV rich. That light is blasting into the darker regions, the cloud from which the stars were formed. As I said earlier, these stars are formed within a dense molecular cloud. This is this giant molecular cloud in Orion. And what was discovered with the Kalper Observatory back in, I guess, the early 80s now, 
this emission spectrum. It's in wave numbers instead of microns. For most of you, it probably doesn't matter. But for the micron levels, it's going from 10 to 5 to 10 microns. And it found this completely unexpected emission. People thought things like carbonates were out there, and there should have been a very strong band of 1,400 wave numbers. There wasn't. That shot a lot of old theories down. And then this became the great mystery for 20 years, because this spectrum was seen all over the place. So there was some sort of material that was completely unexpected, widespread, and it followed a different chemistry than the simple formaldehyde and CO story. So we were lucky, knowing some friends in the oil industry, we would be talking about these with them, and they said, you know, that spectrum looks an awful lot like the vibrational spectrum of soot from a car, and that's what you see on the top. That was from a journal article back in the 70s, that's the Raman spectrum of the black gunk that you could scrape out of a diesel, of an old car, a badly tuned car, or a badly tuned bus. And this was really, believe it or not, the start of something very big. Because what this really told astronomers and told the rest of us, who remember now the mindset of this very simple universe, chemistry was hardly complicated. The Raman spectrum was of those macroscopic soot particles, things you can see and touch. Well, those things are made up of nanometer-sized collections of these little chicken wire things, and those chicken wire things can stack. But individually, they are known as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules. The reason they're called that, you can guess, polycyclic, many rings. Uh, hydrocarbons that contain mostly hydrogen and carbon. The black circles are the carbon, the white circles are the hydrogen. And again, as bio biochemists or biologists, you've probably seen plenty of these things. But it really came as a surprise that this kind of stuff would be out there. So the process that uh, <coughs> makes this take place is imagine how what we're seeing is infrared emission. And what's happening is the UV from those hot stars come in, excite the molecule, the molecule starts to vibrate, and the way it cools down is by throwing out some of that energy in the infrared. And it's the infrared spectrum that we measure with telescopes. But I want to give a little funny demonstration about the fluorescence before we go much further. So we'll see if we can. If someone can lower the shades back there, or I can run back if this is any different. It'll make this a little more fun. Thank you. So the fluorescent process is the UV from the star. Here's the nice orange. See, these things are really old. They're all different. The color is different. The same thing holds in the infrared, which you cannot see. And I'm just going to jump to something at the end of my uh, talk. This is a tool which has not yet been exploited on spacecraft and remote landers and so forth. So by the end, I'm going to argue that this is the kind of technique that should be used. It's cheap and easy to look for things in space. Uh, for example, this room was completely black. As soon as the UV light came on, you'd, for whatever reason, this plastic is glowing. You can see the white parts of this little flag. If you wanted to restore something's luminous, other things do not. This tide bottle, you can see. So if you're looking for things, yeah. by varying the wavelength of the exciting light and studying the emission spectrum of what you're looking at, you can get a lot of information without digging holes and without putting things in mass spectrometers and so on. It's a lot cheaper. And it's a good way to screen things. I've just, they didn't like it, but it became a big part of the uh, infrared fluorescence was something that was really not understood at all. And so what we now have, and I think I better do this over here, this is the spectrum that we're measuring uh, from those pHs and fluorescence. And what those individual lines are due to are the molecules vibrating different types of vibration. As I said earlier, 
the position in the spectrum where the particular lines fall tells you a lot about the carrier. So up there are three microns in CH stretch. In the central regions are the carbon-carbon uh, stretching modes, and in the lower wavelengths are the in and out of plane lens. These are very, very characteristic of these molecules, and we've spent the last 20 years, believe it or not, trying to create a database of these things. So if you fo focus on that brightened band between 7 and 8 microns, the NASA and a few other uh, agencies, but most recently NASA has the, launched the Spitzer Space Telescope. It's extremely sensitive, unprecedented sensitivity, and it was targeting one of its missions was to look, to track this emission throughout the universe, and the results were spectacular. Every molecular cloud has a skin of glowing PAHs. And what you're seeing here is that band at 7 to 8 microns, just tracking the distribution of the PAHs in that cloud. And you can see the different regions, the darker regions, the lighter regions. So this is within our own galaxy. And as I said, there are thousands of pictures like this. They track star forming regions, they associated with reflection nebula, carbon rich involved stars and other galaxies. Here's a picture of another galaxy, again tracing it. Uh, the red color is the PAR emission, and just very widespread carbon. Here's a really peculiar one, the Sombrero galaxy. And if you look at it in the infrared, which is the lower right, and superpose it on the lower left, the Hubble picture, you'll see that the pHs are on the inside of the dark dust ring, which is where they get most of the starlight. So you see, again, the importance of UV bombarding this stuff, and then in the infrared it glows as, as, as the, it's relaxing. And then the most spectacular picture I <coughs> saw on my, on I've seen so far is this one here. Most of you think of galaxies and empty space between the galaxies. This galaxy shows that they're throwing those pHs into intergalactic space as well. So carbon is really, really all over the place. And that's just what we can see. So this is, should, should be starting to make us think a, lot, a much larger or broader ideas about what life may be and what's essential for it. So let me just summarize this bit on the pHs and focus on the astrobiological aspects of these molecules. They're critical to astrobiology because they represent the largest single source of mo molecules that you can react with. Again, most of you have studied biochemistry. You've seen quinolones, little steroids, and so on. All, they all have the aromatic network. Well, these things are the fundamentally aromatic, but of course, these are pure hydrocarbons, and these are the most stable form. But once they get into clouds and in planetary systems, they can react and form these other things. It's not like a piece of coal or a rock. They are very, very abundant. They are more abundant than all the other known <coughs> interstellar molecules combined. So that CO, formaldehyde, methanol, ammonia, if you add them all up, they still don't add up to the abundance of these things. And they contain, I would double those numbers now, some between 10 and 20% of the cosmic carbon is tied up in these things. Pars are also found in meteorites and interplanetary dust particles. And now, with Spitzer being so sensitive, they're actually starting to see evidence for these emission features shortly, a couple of billion years after the Big Bang. So it's starting to be used as a tracer of uh, cosmological timescales. And that means carbon has been around a long time. You didn't have to go through a lot of stellar life cycles uh, to get it. And that's come as a as a surprise. So as I said, because these things are so widespread and obviously important, they're a great <coughs> analytical tool, but there really was no chemistry, no spectroscopy known on these larger species. So for the last 20 years, a good fraction of our work in the James Astor Chemistry Lab has been to study the spectroscopy of these things. And so over the, what we now have is almost 600 theoretically computed and 200 laboratory measured spectral pHs ranging from the very small C10H8, which you know is naphthalene or mothballs perhaps, 
up to C130H28, and those for you know, those of you who are nano people, or that's a graphene sized molecule. So these things really are nanoparticles. So we're talking about uh, cosmic phenomena now that are in part controlled or determined to some extent by, nano, by the properties of nanomaterials. Uh, we've got the spectra of these pHs in neutral and singly charged states, and there are all kinds of different paths in there. The spectra go from 2 to 2,000 microns, and we're going to be making this available, it says, in 2009. Uh, next month is when we should launch this thing, and we're hoping it has a great reception. And just to give you a flavor of what you can do with it, the white spectrum, and you see a different astrophysical spectrum, the dotted white lines. We can do fitting routines, much as you folks would do with mathematics, just to Gaussian fit a band profile or, or deconvolve or chroma, chromatogram, whatever. We can break down, using the database, the fraction of charged species in the neutral form, plus and minus forms in the various astronomical objects. Or we can also break down the molecules by size, large and small. This is just now starting in. So this is the beginning of a whole new era in interpreting these data. Up till now, astronomers <coughs> can say, oh, here are the power features, here are the power features. That's not news anymore. And now we can really start using these as new tools. And I expect chemists will be using them, uh, engineers will be using this database, people in hospitals, because these things are known for, for some of them are very strong carcinogens, and of course they're pollutants as well. So what we've talked about so far is the edges of the clouds, those pictures I showed you of the, glow, the clouds glowing and the PAHs. Now if you point your telescope right towards the heart of the clouds, towards an infrared source that's buried in the cloud, a newly forming star, for example, or a hot star behind the cloud, it just generates a black body. That's the spectrum on the right. And for the temperatures we're talking about, these things span the mid-infrared, the same region we talked about earlier, uh, that chemists use as analytical tools. As the light passes through the clouds, the molecules along the line of sight take out the particular wavelengths uh, corresponding to the, you know, the material, and that uh, we'll study those now, as I said, either from the ground. The SOFIA is the new airplane that will hopefully get started in the next few months. And now we have Spitzer up there that should be Herschel which is the form for a telescope. Now these clouds look dusty, or they look cloud-like because they are dusty, just like our clouds are little uh, particles of water. And what are those dust particles made of? This was the picture again, some, about 1976. These are teeny tiny little particles, half of a micron in size of the dust particles ejected by the stars, but once they get into the cold molecular clouds, the gas in the clouds starts to hit these particles, forming an ice mantle. Again, much as water condenses on a winter, uh, cold winter's day in the mountains or cold states. So there's nothing complicated about this. It's a very simple process. But what's happening out there, as we go from the diffuse medium to the dense medium, you're talking about radicals and atoms, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen coming together, not just simple water molecules freezing on windows. And we were able to duplicate this in the laboratory. And this is work that's gone on here and in Europe in several labs now. And, and what we do is we try to simulate the ice mantle that's just shown there on the lower right on a cold window inside a vacuum chamber. That little vacuum chamber is about this large. What you're seeing in the center is a rotatable cold window. The window is cool to 10, 20 degrees Kelvin, which is similar to the temperature of the dust grains in the dense clouds. We will uh, pass gases into the, in, into the vacuum chamber, that we th the kinds of gas that we think is out there, carbon monoxide, water, methanol, and so on. It freezes onto the window. The window is rotatable. We can rotate the window this way. This sits inside a spectrometer. We can measure the infrared spectrum of the ice, turn the window 90 degrees so it faces the UV lamp that simulates UV from the star, cook the ice in the ultraviolet, dry photochemistry, turn the thing back, 
measure the spectrum and follow the spectral changes. And then in this way, we duplicated exactly what's going on in these dense clouds. And then we can compare directly the spectrum we measure here in the lab of these ices with the spectrum from these telescopes. And this is an example right here. This is one of those embedded protostars, deeply embedded in a dense cloud. The stars in the early forming stages, so you're looking at the infrared radiation from that star, the protostar going through the cloud, and the black body curve is the smooth curve on the top. The absorption bands are obvious, and the ones I've highlighted on the right, we measured with the Kalper Observatory in 1980, and with the dotted, the dots are the data from the airplane, the spectrum from space, the solid line and the dash line is the spectrum we measure in the lab, and we will get a match that's as good as that you can, the one you can see there. We start to believe we've got the right composition. And in the early days, we had to go to various telescopes around the world to piece together one complete spectrum. So what you see here is the same spectrum of W33A on the top left, and the Calper Airborne Observatory data on the top right, but on the bottom left, that data was taken in Hawaii, and the bottom right, that data was taken at a telescope in Chile. And so it was a very long, laborious process. Sometimes it would take a year to get telescope time to piece these things together. But now, thanks to the space age, you get the spectrum in one shot. And this is now a mature field of science. I won't spend a lot of time on it. All these bands were unidentified and mysterious for many years. And it turns out they're all, almost all of them are due to ices except for the silicate feature. There are near 10 microns, and that's the rocky cores. So thanks to these kinds of observations, we know that the ices in dense molecular clouds, and another surprise has been the spectrum doesn't change a whole lot from one cloud to the other throughout the galaxy. So the chemistry seems very similar. And these are all star and planet forming regions. And these are the things that, of course, you will see the, the newly formed planets. And it turns out water is by far the most abundant species in all of these ices. CO is the second most. In some cases, then comes CO2. Very little methane, usually a lot more methanol. And then you can go on down the list. But it, these things are dominated by water-rich ices. And the other surprise that started to come to light is the composition of these ices in dense clouds that we could really understand on the basis of lab comparisons were surprisingly similar to the inferred composition of ices and comets. So the question is, is there a connection between these two things? And that becomes very important in uh, what seeds early planets before chemistry gets started, before biochemistry gets going. So th this would have been, this was the nice end of the story up till the 90s, but it's not the only part of the story. Inside the dense clouds, of course, the new stars are forming, lots of UV, uh, uh, High energy particles are being ejected by the newly formed star, and they really radiate the irradiate the ices in the surrounding region. Even if it's a dense cloud deep inside the cloud in these regions, the ices will get irradiated, and, and that will drive a, a rich chemistry. Here's an example of what happens visually. This before irradiation, that was just a white little ice. It looked like a snow peak in the Sierra. After about one hour of ultraviolet radiation, it picks on this blue color, and this blue color is due to the formation of radicals and new, more complicated species, perhaps even ions. And if you really get into some of the simple chemistry, and this really is simple by the most abundantly known species, carbon monoxide, water, methanol, some methane and ammonia, you can get this array of simple organic molecules, and you, some of them you'll now begin to recognize <coughs> are common in your biochem processes. When this chart was made, very few of these things were known in the interstellar medium. As time has gone on, every one of these molecules on the left and right side have been found. And so it, it's really encouraging, it, it encouraged further work to understand and justify 
working on these funny little ices. So the next thing that became important was after you irradiated the ice, the simple ice, something like water, methanol, CO, and ammonia, the ratio of mostly water, half of, uh, methanol, one to one CO and ammonia. This ice spectrum is the one that matches that spectrum of the ices in interstellar clouds. And so we're starting with a realistic interstellar ice. You are radiated for a few hours. Some fraction gets converted to a very complex organic goop or residue. And that's what you can see here. This is a close up of the cold window. Now, that little copper disc is about the size of a penny. Those are two small 440 screws holding it in place. And what we would do is take that little disc out and analyze it and see what was in there. So the chemistry, it was, chemistry started to get more and more complex as the tools got better. And we found these species. Uh, and again, now we're starting to look more and more uh, prebiotic, maybe, or biogenic, if you will. And the process that forms these things was the irradiation. So now we're beginning to get the bigger picture of what's going on in these ices. In the dense cloud on the top left, atoms, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen hit the cold core and stick. The hydrogen bounces around. The oxygen might move a little. And the combination of H plus O and another hydrogen, since there's so much hydrogen, makes water, primarily makes water. You'll also get ammonia this way. The surprise is that there's more methanol than methane, more CH3OH than CH4. Biochemically, you should like that. And the reason is because the CH3OH now people know is coming, is coming from adding hydrogen to carbon monoxide. So it, and in regions where the hydrogen is in the molecular form, not atomic, you'll get Non-polar species such as CO2, O2, H2 forming in the grains. So you get a little bit of everything, but nothing very complicated, not those big organics that um, we just saw. And ice, OK, so let me summarize. This is the take-home message. Ice, ice surface reaction produce simple molecules. The UV produces the complex molecules. And that makes all the difference. Um, things like water, most of the water that we know about has been formed in this one. So this is a less detailed picture. The grain on the left, little species are condensing out. Atoms hit, form those molecules of water, the ice is made of water, methanol, CO, and so on. Now we should throw some PAHs in there as well. Ultraviolet photons bombard that intimate mixture. That's the key. It's not like UV hitting the ocean. You've got everything close by there. If things are dissolved in water in the ocean, it takes a long time for them to find each other. Yeah. Can you explain the third diagram? Okay, the one on the right is <coughs> if you've warmed that ice up and all the volatile species are gone, you're left with this organic residue. Okay, the more complicated species that are not produced by any of these first two mechanisms, but by the ultraviolet irradiation. And that's just to symbol, uh, symbolize that. And I'll show you some of the evidence we have for that in the next, next week. So now you're probably all wondering, what have cosmic ice has got to do with astrobiology? And I just said most of the water we know about is made in those little grains in space thousands of light years away. And most astronomers think that all or most of the water in the oceans has come from comets, and most of the water in the comets has come from this interstellar process. So you see, we're all part of a long chain of events, and it's complicated in detail, but the conclusions are pretty profound. Most of the water on Earth was brought in by, by comets, and comets have an interstellar ice age. It's important for you to know that. At least for this class, right, Lynn? You got it. <laughs> okay, so now let's go back to that little organic residue. This is the thing in the right. That's what's left after the ice has warmed up. And imagine a comet full of this stuff come crashing into a planet. The water, the simple molecules will evaporate, and but this, this goopy stuff will still remain. 
and even to chemists, it's getting boring to just make a big long list of what chemicals are in there. And during the 90s is when uh, astrobiology started to get some traction and general interest. So you know, there may be a way to look at these differently than simply a chemical analysis. Is there any interest in prebiotic behavior that you could find here? There wouldn't, it wouldn't be. A, there are thousands of compounds in there, and you just can't analyze all of them. So working with Dave Deemer, is Dave part of your series this year? I think we're going to have him a week from Thursday. Oh, okay. I'm working hard around his appointments. Okay, okay. Um, Dave Deemer is a professor at Santa Cruz, and he worked on extracting uh, interesting organic molecules from meteorites, among other things. And when Dave heard about our residues, he said, would you mind if I work with you guys to see if inside those residues you produced any molecules that are interesting? from a prebiotic point of view. And sure enough, what he did is, again, take the vision of the comet crashing into an ocean, or the comet itself falling down in the waters, now by some means hanging around. The organics that are produced by the simple ice, water, methanol, CO, and ammonia, 10 Kelvin, vacuum ultraviolet radiation, we produce molecules, and when Dave would put these under his in his microscope, what he saw slowly forming were these vesicles. So we've gone from something really very, very simple, all of those, water, those molecules on, in the initial ice are water soluble. We're making something that's not water soluble, but so called amphiphilic, has a polar, non polar component. On top of that, these things fluoresce. This is the same field of view. You can see the three on the right that form a line, invisible light, uh, in the bottom right in the UV. Uh, just as you saw here, pumped in the UV, they glow, they glow blue. So we're starting, you know, this is a self-organizing process. This is happening all by itself. And they then took some of our stuff and compared it some of the ice residue uh, amphiphilic molecules to the stuff he was pulling out of the Murchison meteorite. And there are quite, we're happy to see these similarities. Um, every living organism, every known cell has a cell membrane made up of these kinds of molecules. And that was a bit of a surprise. The other interesting thing is the, the ability of those vesicles to absorb ambient UV light and emit uh, fluorescent light is the way something can harvest energy from the surroundings. So all, although this is pure physical chemistry, these things are now starting to show functions that are important biologically. This isn't biology, but this is what many of you are, are studying. Okay, so well, this was so much fun. Let's see what else you can make. Well, let's put in some BAHs. And sure enough, if we put naphthalene, the two-membered uh, bar <coughs> in motor ice and irradiate it, we'll make, these, we'll make quinones, and we'll make juglone, which is something, an actual, an actual bioproduct in, uh, nut, in nut, walnuts and pecan shells and so on. And the one on the bottom with anthracene, this is a, one of the products formed by an aloe plant. So we're not, even though what we're doing is completely abiotic, the kinds of products that are naturally produced on a very wide range of conditions uh, look like they're important for biogenic processes. Lastly, uh, with Max, we started to work looking for amino acids. And sure enough, amino acids are formed in these ices as well. And most recently, uh, Scott Sanford and Stephanie Milan have made some of the nucleic acids in these ice simulations. So there's really everything in high concentration, in close proximity to one another, in these irradiated ices. Uh, everything that you'd need almost for an RNA world. We've got things, uh, amino acids, sugar precursors, things that look like nucleic acids, and now we know they're there as well. And we've also got the uh, amino, the 
membrane forming types of molecules. So what, what this generated was a lot of interest in maybe something that was widely ignored, i.e. the delivery of interesting biogenic molecules to an early uh, primitive planets and having them be an important part of the biogenesis on the planet started to get credibility. And this is the summary of what I've just been talking about for the last 50 minutes, I guess. The solar, the life cycle of a star, eventual formation of ices and dense molecular clouds, and once a star and planet system is formed in that dense cloud, these things start to rain down onto those primitive planets. And if it happens to be in the habitable zone, which one of the keys for the definition of the habitable zone is that water is present in the liquid form, and many of these processes uh, start to take place. Of course, you know, most of the, <coughs> there are various other ideas, most of them are of the origin of life is considered on the planet itself. Why is this important? Because if you look at the uh, initial appearance of fossils, according to the biolo my biologist friends, the appearance of life was very fast after the Earth cooled out. This is a little clock, and the large numerals are billions of years. We are at the 12 o'clock point, but if you go backwards to some four and a half billion years ago is when the Earth and its solar system was forming. It was very hot, and apparently the first fossils are almost four, back, almost four billion years ago, and that's a, a short period of time for the level of complexity to occur that, we, that is characteristic of the of life processes. So a visual summary of what I've just said is right here. Comets coming in, delivering extraterrestrial materials to a nice, pleasant, habitable planet. The stuff falls into pools or oceans. Compounds come together, and somehow or other, the processes start. Summarizing what we've talked about make, making in these ices are all these things here. The amphiphilic molecules form the cell membrane type of structure. The amino acids are formed as well, and substituted aromatics are often used as things to transport, uh, transport agents across cell membranes. So as I said earlier, a lot of the ingredients for the RNA world are apparently readily made in these interstellar ice simulations. So in summary, you can read this as well. My last conclusion there is, if, con if conditions are right and biochemistry is extreme chemical complexity, the conclusion that the universe is poised for life seems inescapable. So this is the uh, end of what I would call the detailed part. Now I'd like to speculate a little bit more as to what might be the challenges of the future and where we're going. First, having said all this wonderful stuff about now we can make these uh, building blocks of life, no one has a clue as to how we go from the left to the systems that have biological function. And I think the rest of your course will be talking about a lot of this and what might or might not happen. One of the things we're trying to understand is the change on those aromatics to functionalized aromatics. What's going on there? And we. Uh, put that in the context of the astrophysical <coughs> question, what happens to PAHs in cold, dark, interstellar clouds, i.e. when they're frozen in ices? And to make a long story short, we find that once the pods are frozen into the ice, they are easily ionized. So all of a sudden, a whole new process has just been introduced that has lots of energy. The UV goes in, the electron is removed from the aromatic molecule, it becomes a cation. We see that in the spectrum here. The molecule on the neutral molecule drops away on the left, the, the absorption band disappearing. As that disappears, correlated very tightly is the appearance of the new band near 450 nanometers now in the visible. That's blue. That means this ice, as you irradiate, it slowly becomes red because it absorbs it, it takes out the blue. 
and it's because we're producing these ions uh, within the ice very, very easily. Surprisingly, they're quite stable. This is a larger PAH, corterolene. You see it on the right. Again, it's the same story. The neutral band disappears on the left. Now, it's a larger molecule, so it absorbs more out in the red. As you're irradiating it, the neutral disappears. The cation appears about 850 nanometers beyond what you can see. And we kept this ice cold for over a month, warming it up every day from 10 Kelvin up to 150 Kelvin. And you'll notice the radical cation, the plus form of the pH band there at 850. The solid line shows it at 20 Kelvin. The dashed line shows it at 120 Kelvin. And the area under the peak is the same. The species has not reacted at all. And these are temperatures corresponding to the icy moons of Jupiter and beyond, Neptune and so forth. So this kind of chemistry could become really important. The other surprise is the ionization energy gets, gets lowered by two electron volts, which is probably of very little interest to most of you here, but it's a way to boost processes. And this is probably the role water plays in a lot of living systems. It helps, helps move things around with a lot less energy than it would otherwise take. So now some simple pictures. As I said, once you've irradiated these ices that get colored, notice the back, the pastel light blue, light blue color in the back of this. Uh, this residue picture, and a lot of the icy planets, as I said, outside the orbit of Jupiter, have these fascinating colors. And the question you have to ask is, do trapped organic ions and uh, contribute to the colors? Fluorescence is another thing to look at in these planets. If these species are laying on the surface, you'll get these funny glowing these funny kinds of colorations. And as I said earlier at the beginning of the class, one of the things I hope we can start to see are UV flashes put on instruments like this. Imagine a little rover sitting in the dark at night. If it sh shoots off a UV flash and the cameras are taking a picture, <laughs> all kinds of things could become real. And it costs not, almost nothing. It's the same equipment is out there. You just have to add a UV flashlight. And we're working on convincing the powers that be that this is not a bad idea. Another thing about PAHs is a number of years ago. That was, I think it's 15 years ago, 1996. This famous Martian meteorite. They found PAHs in there as well. And that was invoked as a biomarker. Who knows if that's correct or not. This is where the field is now, and this is where the challenges are. Let me conclude now with these conclusions, and then I'll show some real summaries in a moment. Ionized pods, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, are shockingly large molecules uh, by interstellar standards, and they're widespread and abundant throughout the interstellar medium and throughout the cosmos, actually. As you said, this first slide I showed, Remember, CO and formaldehyde were making the headlines, and that was in the 60s. We've come a long way. In cold molecular clouds, where planets and stars are formed, interstellar molecules freeze out and they'll form ice particles containing species such as water, methanol, ammonia, CO, and the pHs, of course. And in these clouds, especially close to star and planet forming regions, these ices are processed by the UV light into far more complex species, many of them are biogenically important. And comets and meteorites, which contain this residue material, see primordial planets with these compounds, where they should take, they have to take place in the building chemistry on the young, the young worlds. So as I said at the beginning, I, I really think this is what this, the take home message or the conclusion of this, this part of your class has to be. Astrochemistry is astrobiology, and we're driving forward in this general direction. And this doesn't happen by itself. I've had the good fortune to work with a lot of good people over the years, and this is just most of these folks have gone on. A couple of them were Stanford students when this picture was taken, and now people are all over JPL, Canada, uh, France. 
So it, the field is still growing, and these are the people who play the role of it. So thank you. best discipline speakers you'll have all semester. So there's plenty of time if you want to ask questions. And I, I suggest you do that. It's about a quarter to five. So there's plenty of time. Oh, cool. okay. um, so do your uh, findings mean that the, the other theories about the uh, creation of organic molecules on the Earth, like the Uri Miller experiment, are less important? Or um, do you think like both processes possibly happening at the same yeah. time? I, yes, I think they, you can't stop these things from happening. They, they are going on all the time. The Stardust mission just returned some bona fide particles from comets, not icy, not the icy component, but the dust. And they're finding a number of the organics similar to what um, we're making in these ices. And the comet is really just the accumulation of these little interstellar ice particles. So they have to be bombarding uh, the early planets. Now, as I said, a lot of people think most of the water on Earth came through this way. Once the planet was freshly formed and hot, all the volatiles for the inner planets that they put in the orbit of Mercury probably just became molten silicon. And then took a while before they cooled down and then comets, comets and meteorites are crashing all the time, of course, but eventually cooled enough so these things were not gasified and evaporated right away, and eventually accumulated into water, the oceans, and but it brought everything else along with it, the ammonia, the CO, CO probably evaporated pretty quickly, but these large organics had to be there as well. Now, the advantages I've briefly mentioned for something happening in an ice is that everything is adjacent to itself. Whereas you can imagine a large ocean, yeah, a photon might come in, an interesting molecule might get produced, but it's going to take a long time, and who knows what's going to happen before it finds another one. So that's what, this is why it goes way back. I think even Darwin himself was talking about a warm little pond just to concentrate things up. Uh, the answer to your question is no one knows. Don't believe anything anyone tells you. Uh, I, I grew up, I mean, as I said, I grew up at a time when these molecules, CO made headline, new, the New York Times front page articles. I mean, this, and to tell you, I gave this talk, I talked about, when we first saw the amphibolic molecules of Dave Beamer, I talked about this at the University of Paris, and people came up to me afterwards and said, Lou, what are you going crazy? Because uh, it really was too shocking, and I knew I knew it was a gamble, and so I waited for about five years. Those pictures were taken in 1989. I didn't have the courage to speak about them until about the mid-90s, because I knew the reaction it would get. And now it's okay. So, as I say, take everything you've learned as a grain of, with a grain of salt. Um, there's a lot of discovery still to be made, and we don't know. All those things are happening. What set the spark? That's why I had the large the slide with the big question. There, ice that is from near is still predominantly water, and can you test that with spectrograms? Yes, the, the, that's the rough. Um, in some strange, divine sense of humor, we can tell what these ices are made of in one stark molecular cloud, hundreds if not thousands of light years away. Our sun doesn't produce much infrared, so it barely goes out to five microns. So there is no light coming from these icy planets in this mid-infrared region. So there is speculation, and yes, people do know there are things like water. Now they're starting to have the courage to talk about things like aromatic and aromatics and organics, but the solar system folks generally didn't like to talk about organics in those ices. But that's starting to change. Uh, but you, it should be all similar. Now, the difference is if it's a big chunk of ice and it's exposed you know, to solar radiation all the time, any infalling material might get processed and mixed in with it. Uh, but it's, it's hard to, you know, we don't know what's going on, but those colors are telling you something is going on and no one really understands what they are, whether it's 
It's hard to imagine after all these years of being pretty much primordial commentary material. Uh, they, it's, that ice has been there for a long time and probably processed by the processes on that. Is that helpful? Yeah. yeah. There, there's a question back there first and then. Um, in these icy mantles, are there any salts um, in your experiments? No, and, and that's what surprised us when we ionized with, with the pH and they became ionized readily. So in some sense, if you've got a cation, there's some, like, something holding the anion, the, the electron. So these are going to start to behave like salts. Now I have to say, this is work that's like six months, a year old, that's been come, getting published. Most people are not paying attention to it yet. But I think that's going to change the physical properties of these ices enormously. Mm -hmm and the chemistry as well. And that gets back to your icy planet question. These P all organics, it looks like, have an ionization potential lowered by two electron volts. So normally you hear the phrase, ionizing energy less than 200 nanometers. Well, we're, we're ionizing these things with, with light you know, 300 nanometers, which is four electron volts, which is really nothing. It's just gentle, and it suddenly goes into this ionized form. And it's stable. And I have to say, we also <coughs> studied some of these things years and years ago at Leiden University in the Netherlands, where there's a great effort from studying these icy processes. Some of these irradiated ices, if we, some crazy days, we shut the lights and we're in the dark, and then slowly warm them up, and they'd actually spark and flash, look like lightning shooting across them. So there's charge in there. So what's the advantage of using uh, airborne observers to Sophia versus using like, a regular satellite in space? Like, why do we use that? Well, it's, well, <laughs> it's a lot cheaper, and you have access to it. So you can change instruments. Uh, why not use like, a ground-based observatory then instead? Well, because of the water. You, you can't, water in space has the same absorption and emission bands as water in our atmosphere. So we have to get above the... Uh, the water in the clouds and so on. So 30, 40, 35 to 40,000 feet is what we need to do to get about 90% of the water. And so then the sky opens up in the infrared. But, so it's number one, it's cheaper. These satellites are, are billions of dollars. And the airplane is an airplane. It's not cheap, but it's an airplane. But the real advantage, I think, is you can go in that thing and with hands-on experience, you know, you can change spectrometers, you can change detectors. As technology becomes advanced, you can put the latest equipment on the airplane, whereas in space, a lot of these things are frozen 20 years before. So, for example, some of these things, that these pictures I've showed you, were from detectors that were developed in the early 90s. Now, you, you know about Moore's Law. If we could fly stuff that was developed, you know, two years ago, would pictures, with the, the information of these pictures and spectrum would be studied. But it just takes that long. <coughs> so the plane gives you a little bit of a quick peak, a cheap, a cheap peak, and then you can build a spacecraft if it's really important. Um, I thought it was, uh, it's really incredibly interesting that your, your conclusion about it's almost inevitable that life would form. I mean, because... Well. Then I say that I maybe I got a little too big exuberant, but, well, I mean, but it sure seems like yeah. you and know. I was just thinking. I mean, if you can find that at this planet that um, Austin talked about, um, Cleos, Cleos, if we can find that some meteorite landed on it in the past I mean, mm -hmm. millions of years, um, bringing with it all this kind of these interstellar molecules with the pHs, if it contains the same sort of particles that Earth contained and, and now contains, it almost seems that, yeah, inevitable that we should find life. If, as I say, that's a big if. If life is extreme chemical complexity. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, as we, we, now, we now have the Legos. Right. And you just throw the bag on the floor of it, building a castle or a house or whatever. It's, I mean, it would be interesting to find if, if there wasn't. Why? Why? Like, well, I, I think biochemists are the ones who are going to struggle yeah. with this and find out.
Uh, would you would you, would you have people talking about the, the real chemistry of life? Do you think they? Uh, between Dave Deemer and me, we'll think of something. <laughs> well, it's very complicated. And, and again, as I said before, don't believe anything you hear because people say we've created life in a test tube, but it's generally very controlled. You know, they've stacked the deck very high and strongly to get certain processes. So that's what this why we were so surprised. All of a sudden, this same for, uh, and this is a terrible word, the ability to make cell membrane like molecules starting from water, methanol, and ammonia, and CO, you know, and the harsh radiation. That really came as a surprise. And that usually the things are getting destroyed, not being made. And then they carried that extra functionality with them. So there's something, I think there's a whole new law of thermodynamics that people are going to discover on the fourth law. Something is driving this. It seems like it goes against entropy and everything else. So uh, we saw, I guess, we were saying about simple reactions like formulones and and naphthalene. So what about, um, I mean, what about like the spontaneous creation of like nucleic acids? Has that, has any work been done? Well, on that? They, I I mentioned that I didn't include the slide a few months ago. Uh, Stephanie Mallon and Scott Sanford <coughs> doing these kinds of experiments in our lab made nucleic acids. And uracil, do you remember uracil? And I think that. <coughs> they can be made, and so they're part of the mix. However, they they did stack the deck a little bit. They started with uh, pyridine, not simply water, methanol, and ammonia, because it's just getting really hard <coughs> to uh, study. To, if, if you know a specific molecule you're looking for, you're talking about a milligram of material and a thousand compounds in there. And the pH work we did, the quinones and all, that was done here at Stanford in Nick Zare's lab. He, um, they developed this instrument that's super sensitive, two laser techniques. And, uh, My other question about it, so then at the beginning of when all these things were coming together, how did you, how were they stabilized? How were they not oxidized? Like, or how, well, you know, like things like nucleic acids or a lot of these cell membranes, how are they not just like destroyed and how do they, in, well, in the uh, maybe it's because they're cold. I don't know. Why, why, I guess I'm not understanding. I'm not a biochemist, so I'm not understanding. Yeah. You mean if you put these things in liquid water, they would yeah. become oxidized? You don't need a peroxide? Uh, like how, but how do they just, how do they all sort of stick together in the very end? Yeah, that's the, yeah. But it's, it's the ice that <coughs> makes it happen. I think it's a, the, the structure of the ice, water ice, has its own architecture. It's a very polar environment, so things can fit into cavities. But water itself, maybe part of the secret is the ice structure itself uh, is, is thermodynamically stable. You have the oxygen and two hydrogens, and the ice structure, they all interlock. And so to pull an oxygen out just to oxidize something may cost a lot more energy because it has to pull it out of the network of the, of the ice structure. I, I don't, I'm guessing, but if you can you can store ions in here, that's so. Uh, you know, somehow or other, you can separate a plus and a minus charge, and Coulomb forces are very very strong. This is all new stuff. That's why I showed this at the end. <laughs> it's the tomorrow. <laughs> you probably got the idea. Dr. Alvindo has been very modest. He's been at the forefront of this for decades, which is why I had him in here. This is he. He may look, you know, like a, a regular sort of professor with a tie and everything, but he's a real radical in this field of astrochemistry, from what I gather. Um, a couple of little things. Do you remember he showed a picture in the middle that said um, it was a painting by William Hartman? Remember, he was the guy they showed painting in the um, If We Had No Moon show that I, sh that I showed on the first day, so I just thought you might be interested in that for trivia. Um, and what I wanted to say is that the take-home message that I always give when I talk about your work, when you're not there, of course, um, is, is that what Lou and his colleagues are doing is finding this language of chemistry out there in the universe that is very similar to the language of chemistry that we see in life on Earth. And so to me, what that suggests is if there is life somewhere else, 
that it may very well be based on similar chemistry, just as we said here, we're sitting on a large silicate rock and we're not based on silicon, it's organic carbon with perhaps water as a solvent and so on. Um, and that means if you, you really want to take it to its extreme, that students sitting on um, whatever planet around Alpha Centauri are basically using their Alpha Centauri in translation of whatever biochemistry book you're using. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.